has made you glad. No matter what's going on in this wicked old world, full of sin and sinners and all kinds of things, we still have a great and an awesome God, a wonderful God that loves us beyond all things. It is wonderful. We are going through a study that I've called Just Like Jesus. Uh, we handed out those bracelets, the What Would Jesus Do bracelets. Some of you are still wearing them, and I've heard some reports of how that has reminded people to behave a little differently once in a while, uh, look at people differently. And uh, today I'd like to look at the holiness of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I know that He's God, and that He is absolutely holy, because God is the standard, right? So whatever He is, is right. And uh, the, the thing about holiness is that it enables us to have the right kind of impact on all of those that we are around. And that's what enabling virtue is all about. You know, you ever feel like there's no real reason for you to be here on this earth? You know, I know my mother, she has said so many times uh, as she's gotten older, why am I still here? Why can't I already be in heaven? Oh, and she struggles with a lot of things, you know, with a lot of loved ones that have already died, and uh, my father who died quite a number of years ago, and uh, now she's in a nursing facility, although she has a lot of capabilities still. And I just keep telling her, Mom, God's not finished with you. And it's probably not things that God's trying to do in her as much as it is through her. You say, well, who can you minister to in a nursing home? Who can't you minister to? Right? And her life is still having an impact on people around her. If you have no purpose, you know, often you have difficulty living a pure and a holy life. We live in a society that, not, that pulls you away from righteousness. In almost every sector of our society and around the world and other societies, there is a push and a pull toward everything anti-God, anti-righteous. I mean, look at the confusion in our young people today that don't even know if they're men or women or male or female. And it is terrible. Look at the anxiety level of adults, but especially our young people today. They are overwhelmed by everything in life. Why? There's no foundation. They're bobbing around like they were a, a little fishing bobber on top of a rough stream or a, a you know, windy pond. Because there's no foundation. There's nowhere to plant their feet and say, I know this is where I belong. This is where I stand. A life without purpose quickly becomes a life that is disposable or valueless. That is not who we are as Christians. That should not even enter your mind, even though the devil and the society are trying to pound it into you every single day. It should never enter your mind because with Christ Jesus, with the Holy Spirit in you, you not only have purpose, but you have power to make a difference no matter what the circumstance of life. Our problem is we focus on the wrong things. We want things. We want to make people do certain things. Jesus wants us to be more like the shepherd. The shepherd leads. We want to be sheepdogs, running around barking at everybody, making them go where we want, right? That's not what the shepherd does. The shepherd calls out, follow me, and they follow because 
That is the one that is the source of hope. That is the one that leads them to the calm, clear waters and the one that leads them into the safe pasture where they can feed. In a world filled with wolves, I think we misunderstand that holiness is a straitjacket on us when really holiness is what will empower us and brighten us so that this world has something, someone they can follow. Hope, the peace, and in fact, righteousness. Because as much as this world cries out, <clears throat> this is where the pleasure is. The cost is always tremendous. Tolstoy wrote, everybody thinks of changing humanity. Nobody thinks of changing himself. Luke chapter 4, verse 33 it says, and in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. He's speaking to Jesus Christ here. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Thou art, art thou come to destroy us. I know thee who thou art. Thee. Holy One of God. Capitalized. Okay? I recognize who you are. You're God in disguise. But he didn't just say our judge. He said the Holy One. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we pray that you would, Lord, Impress upon us, Lord, how that the truth truly can set us free. That a holy life is not a straight jacket, Lord. It is a freedom from the bondage of sin, the shame and the guilt of all the failures of our lives. It is that which will, Lord, enhance the beacon of light that we are to be to those in this dark and dangerous world. Or work on our hearts, our attitudes, our minds, our ability to choose. Lord, let us feel the solid foundation of truth. Everything that we do and everywhere we're at. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Holiness. This characteristic of God, of Jesus Christ. It involves a consecration and a purity in life. What does that mean? What is consecrate? To consecrate is to declare sacred or to devote irrevocably to God. So when we consecrate ourselves or something, in the Old Testament, they consecrated items for the tabernacle and the temple. And that meant it wasn't to be used for anything else. It was only for the purpose of bringing glory and honor and worship and praise to God. It was kept separate. It was kept pure. It was kept in a place of honor so that it could be used and everyone would look at it and say, this represents everything we want to be before God and everything that God is before us. And purity, the word basically means unmixed, spotless, free of pollutants. And then we look at ourselves and we say, there is no way we can be holy, consecrated, fully, and pure. And there is truth in that. We're all sinners. Though we're believers, we have the Holy Spirit in us, and our sins are forgiven once we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, we still sin, we still are sinners, we'll not be judged for it, but it is still a pollutant in everything that we do, everything that we are, every decision we make, even every word that comes out of our mouth. 
what Jesus is saying here and what the, the, uh, the writer, Luke, Dr. Luke, is saying is even though that's who you are, you know, you're in eight sinfulness, the Holy Spirit, if you'll really surrender to Him and follow Him, can elevate you so far above that that you absolutely look and appear differently. Have you ever seen gold as it comes out of the ground? You know, unpurified. Okay, I, you've been to a museum, you've been somewhere and you've seen one. And it, it has a haziness, a, a lack of clarity, it has, you know, a dullness. You can tell it's gold, but it's, you know. And then you look at it when it's been purified, you know, even like a 24 karat gold. And it just glistens. They're both gold. But just one is more pure than the other. Same with a diamond. It looks like a rock until they cut it and clean it and polish it. That's what the Holy Spirit's trying to do in our lives. God says, I know you're not holy in and of yourselves, but my Spirit, my Holy Spirit is within you. Therefore, the power exists to become more and more holy. You see, Jesus made every choice correctly. Why? Well, I know he was God, but for our example, it's because he did everything because he was consecrated to the Father's will. He even stated at one point, not my will. What does that mean? He would rather have not had to go through it. But... I will be done. Like I said, granted it was intrinsic in his very nature. It was natural for him. I mean, in Luke 1, 35, it says, The angel said unto Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And it was recognizable in all of his interactions with people. We have all these records of how Jesus interacted with people, and he wasn't like you and me in our natural state. He had compassion beyond compassion and mercy beyond mercy, and he had a, a patience. I mean, remember, this is almighty God who is timeless. I wonder what it felt like for a God who could create everything with a word to wait upon these disciples for three and a half years to even get a little bit of it. You've experienced that. Trying to teach somebody something and it's like, come on, this is the simple stuff. And yet here was Jesus. He dedicated three and a half years of his life on this earth for these disciples so that they could learn at the best rate that they could. He is the almighty God. He is perfect in every way. And yet, people were not afraid to approach Jesus. In Hebrews 7, 26, it says, For such an high priest, Jesus, became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And yet the children wanted to run to him, people with ailments, people who were full of sin, even demon-possessed people actually approached him. I mean, this is not a hate monger. They like to call Christians haters. That's not who Christ was. People sought him out. He was supernatural, but he was not terrifying. He was powerful, but there was no malice in him at all. In other words, his purity and his holiness made him 
approachable. For one thing, people knew they could trust him. Imagine being one of the disciples and failing Jesus miserably, which they did often, and knowing that this is the guy that they witnessed calming the seas in the storm, raising the dead. And when he walked by a tree and the tree wasn't performing and he said, look, I'm going to curse you, the next day they walk by and it's dead. Now fail in front of that guy that you're accountable to. And yet they keep coming back, they keep following, they keep saying, why? Because even though he was powerful, even though he was perfect, never hateful, his desire was never to harm, but always to improve, always to encourage. Even the people that didn't believe in him, he fed them too. How many of the 4,000 of the 5,000 that he fed do you think were really believers? I mean, he turned around and went home. They didn't follow him. In every way, even uh, people just did not understand him. They could not think like him, but because of his holiness, because of who he was, they were drawn to him. Some were drawn to him and hated the fact they were drawn to him. Some were drawn to him and he, they saw him as an enemy and they tried to destroy him and yet they just couldn't hardly not come. He was so unique. He was so pure. Purity in your life is not going to drive people away. It's going to make you trustworthy. It's going to make you welcoming. It's going to give you compassion. Those kind of things. What about in our lives? We naturally are drawn to everything we're not supposed to do. Taboo, for some reason, to the sinful heart is so enticing. The unknown can be either terrifying or exciting. Sin and pulls at our sensual nature. This is humankind's natural state. Jesus' natural state is holiness. Our natural state is sinfulness. It's just that clear. And what's that say about the church? You know, here, the health of a church depends not merely on the creed which it professes, not even on the wisdom and holiness of a few great ecclesiastics, but on the faith and virtue of its individual members. This church is not this building. This church is not a name or a corporation. This church is you. And this church is only as holy and virtuous as each one of us. The believer is given a new nature. The Bible is very clear about that. We are given a new nature when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ. However, we must must nurture that new nature so that its perspective and its power rules and reigns in our lives, not just what we're comfortable with, because that's what we started with. A lot of people have very difficult time changing because they're comfortable with whatever they were in, whether it was good or bad. We find this a lot in, in a lot of different areas of our life, but in, in the workplace, People have always done it this way. It doesn't matter if there's a better way necessarily. I just can't change because that's what I've always done. We find it in uh, abuse victims. How many people have you known down through the years that were in an abusive relationship, got out of it, and what did they do? They went right back into another one. 
you would say, man, don't you know better? Yes, they know better, but that's all they knew, and they're comfortable because it's not right, but it's what I know. How sad. And Christian, you have an opportunity to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ because His own Spirit, the mind of Christ is now in you. And we keep saying, no, I never did it that way before. In 1 Peter 2, 21, it says, For even here unto, even right to this point, you were called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. It says Jesus wasn't reactionary. Jesus went forward with the plan that God set out, and God said, this is the way you're going to do things. And Jesus said, it doesn't matter what people are doing to me. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are like. Right is right, and that's what I need to do. It's an attitude that most of us struggle with. We want what's comfortable. We want what's easy. We want what's profitable. And sometimes God says, that's not where I need you. Now, sometimes He does. And God has, God has raised up some Christians at different times that have become fabulously wealthy and used it for His glory. But if you go back through the history of most of humankind, which I don't know how many billions of people that would be, they are few and far between. Why? Because most of us begin to worship what we have instead of using it as a resource for the one that gave it to us. When we do start following and we start recognizing the differences that are in our lives, sometimes we get this holier-than-thou attitude and there isn't anything that will drive people away from you faster than that. I'm better than you. No, we're not. At our best, every one of us humans is still just a sinner saved by grace. We do well not to forget that. But you know, being holy, if I can use that word so loosely with humans, being holy is not enough. What value would it have been if Jesus, who is holiness, came to earth, walked around a while, and then didn't change anything? refused to go to Calvary's cross for us, refused to pay for our sins, refused to offer us everlasting life. What value would His holiness have been to you and me? None. What value is it if you live a righteous life, the best righteous life anybody ever lived, but you never impact another person with it? You may as well have been in heaven the whole time because you're useless to the mission God gave us. We call that virtue. Virtue has a lot of definitions, but the power to affect beneficial change, just like Jesus. Jesus didn't come to show off His holiness and His power. He came to make a difference in people's lives. Synonyms include morality, beneficial, valor, merit, potency. I mean, listen to those words and listen to how big of a word virtue really is. Morality, beneficial, valor, merit, and potency. The power to make a difference. In our text in Luke 4, 33, a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. Now, wait a minute. If Jesus was there just to observe, they wouldn't have worried about him. 
What have we to do with thee? Hey, we're the ones that you kicked out of heaven. Thou art thou come to destroy us? We're unholy and you're holy. Is that why you're here? You're going to judge us and throw us into Tartarus? You're going to throw us into the deepest pits of hell? He said, we know who you are. You may be wearing flesh, but we recognize you. You're none other than the Son of God that we have stood before for our entire existence in heaven. The, I love the way I mean, here is evil looking at God and saying, I know who you are. You're the good guy. You're the holy one of God. Wow, what a statement. We recognize you because we followed the wrong guy. Virtue is used it's translated virtue six times in the scripture. And the first three are used to reveal the intrinsic power to affect change that Jesus had. The root of the word that is used here is the, where we get our word dynamite from. What do you think of with dynamite? It affects change, doesn't it? Okay? It is powerful. That's the idea. The other word translated virtue is really about manliness, praise, and an intrinsic excellence in who you are. The world takes these things and they take little bits of it and then they skew it off somewhere. An intrinsic excellence. That means you are following the Holy Spirit's will so much so that even when the world, people around you, your job, economy, whatever it is, sickness comes into your life, you are intrinsically holy and you respond in an appropriate way. Not like the unsaved world does. The last three are about the believer being empowered to be and to do more. The first three are about the power and the purity and the ability of the Lord Jesus Christ to affect change. And the last three are that encouragement, the empowered Christian being able to pass on what Jesus gave them. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Jesus said, I'm your example. Here's me doing it. This is what it looks like when you do. Here's me doing it. This is what it looks like when you do. Here's me doing it. This is what it looks like when you do it. Isn't that wonderful? The King of Kings, Lord of Lords, took the time to say, Look, I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step instruction. I'm going to dumb it down to where you can actually get it. <laughs> but thankfully, he was a lot more generous and didn't use those words. to produce and induce change. His Holy Spirit is in us, empowered by the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, and as we follow, as we're obedient, as we surrender to it, it produces a change in us that is so powerful, so uh, transformative, that we become an agent of change in other people's lives. That's what this is about. Holiness that empowers virtue. I mean, that empowers that ability for us to be exactly what Jesus told us to be, the light of the world. When Jesus was here, I mean, the, the civilized world around there, everybody knew who he was. Oh, Jesus is coming to town. Let's go see him. Do you believe in him? No, but man, I got to see this guy. When we walk into somebody's life, at first it may be a light shining on their evil, but when they come to understand that we don't look down on them, 
have compassion toward them, when we're not there to judge them and abuse them, but we're there to be a beacon of hope, a place of peace and comfort, a place they can come to and say, look, this life is just destroying me. I need somebody to help me find some peace and hope. That they come to us. That's the idea. You know, Jesus walked around. He was, he was in one place when he was on this earth at a time. And so what happened? Because of who he was, because of the, the different person that he was than anybody else they'd ever seen, when he walked down the street, people came to him. And I want you to notice this. Jesus didn't just stay in one place and say, hey, if anybody wants me, come see me. He went and moved around and said, look, I need to have an impact on more people than I've ever had before. My, the idea is not to go into the sanctuary, not to go into the synagogue and just hide out. And if anybody really wants to see me, they can come. And the way he got into the innermost parts of the the uh, the synagogue or the temple where well, you had to be a Jew, you had to be in good standing, you had to have done the sacrifices. I mean, there was a whole bunch of requirements. So he would have been saying, only those who are super religious can come see me. Instead, he walked in the streets, he went to the wells where everybody was, he went through the gates where people met, he even went to places where he would be seen and interact with people that society didn't even accept. And when he went, he did not let their sinfulness rub off on him. Instead, he shone a light upon their sinfulness till they could recognize, hey, there's something wrong here. We need to follow this guy and see what's going on. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, it says, You who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, why in the world do you and I need to punish people? What we're able to do does not even compare to what God's going to do. Instead, he says, your job is to intercede for those people and to get them on the other side so I don't have to do that to them. And sometimes... We get the attitude, here, I'm going to usher you to judgment, and you deserve it. It's not our job. Jesus' sense of justice and judgment was absolute, just as was his forgiveness and willing to deliver. Absolute justice. And he knows that the wages of sin is death. So you know what he did? He went and died for us. Wow. He didn't take away the sinfulness. He didn't say it's not sin anymore. He didn't change the rules. He just simply said, I'll pay for it. And I'll give you my spirit to change from who you used to be. 1 John 3, 5, And ye know that he was manifested. He was presented to us to take away our sins. And in him was no sin. You know what you need to understand here today, if you're not a believer, is Jesus will impact your eternity one way or another. Either you're on his side and your sins are forgiven and therefore you don't have to stand at the white throne judgment, you have no fear of hell, or you don't accept him, and he is the one sitting on the judgment seat, uh, the white throne judgment, that says, I never knew you. 
It doesn't matter if you were religious. It doesn't matter if you were sincere. It doesn't matter if you were better than everybody around you. You never accepted me, and therefore your place is in a fiery torment forever and ever and ever. And so he gave us the one job of kind of being the traffic cop that says, hey, don't go that way, go this way. Don't follow the crowd into hell. Follow Jesus into heaven. We can't make any of them do that. All we can do is say, hey, this is the right choice. He forgave the sinners. He healed the broken. He reached out to those who were cast off. He brought hope to the hopeless. And he paid the debt that we could not pay. Now compare that to our attitudes in our stressful situations, in our everyday lives, when we're dealing with people that drive us nuts or even desire evil toward us. Would people say those things about us? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It all comes down to accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care how religious you are. If you have not truly accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, what does that mean? That means you believe that Jesus is who he says he was, the Son of God, God come in the flesh. And then he went to Calvary's cross, not for his sin, but for your sin. That you are a sinner and therefore ineligible for heaven, a need to be saved, you need those sins paid for. And you know you can't do it, so what do you do? You say, Jesus, save me. That's what it's about. Again, he kept it very simple, didn't he? It's very clear. It's very simple. It's, you know, it's not about baptism. It's not about church membership. It's actually not even being about a good person. It's about accepting him. After you become a Christian, then by the power of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit in you, and your surrender to him, he gives you the power to become, to consecrate yourself, to sanctify your behavior so that you can begin to be a more powerful impact in this world for him. You can look more and more like Jesus and have the kind of impact that he had. In our lives, we're often, we often believe we're powerless. But as sons of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, indwelt by the very Spirit of God. Now, we're not in command of Him. Do not mistake that. We don't get to command God. But by Him speaking to us and saying, this is what you should be doing, we can with confidence go there because we know He has the power to do whatever needs to be done. We would make bad choices. Yeah. We just get all caught up in the moment sometimes instead of saying, okay, Lord, thy will be done, not mine. Second Peter 1 3, it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, how? Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to what? Glory and virtue. Glorifying him and impacting everyone around us with the righteousness, with the holiness that is now becoming a part of who we are. And it's not our own holiness anyway. It's his. empowered to godliness and virtue. Isn't that something? To glory and to virtue. According as His divine power hath given us. Listen to those words. And those aren't my words. Those aren't Baptist words. Those are God's words. Right? 
We can trust those. What are we waiting for, Christian? You know what? It's time we get started learning, growing, making a difference. Too many of us spend our life either saying it's somebody else's job or seeming to tread water in our Christianity to the point we just couldn't save anybody else because we can't hardly keep our own head above water. Now how does that align with a God who says, I am your everything. I give you every breath you take, every heartbeat you have, when Peter said, Lord, if that's you, he said, you call me and I'll just jump right out of this boat and walk to you. And Jesus said, okay. What happened? Peter jumped out of the boat and walked on the water. He's not barely keeping his head above water to breathe in the storm. Walking on the water. Why do we spend so much of our time just trying to keep our nose above water and just trying to survive when the Almighty God said, that's not what I want for you. There will be times where trials and tribulations will be so harsh, but that's for a purpose. Peter, I let you walk on the water until you took your eyes off of me, and then I let you sink. But as soon as you said, save me, I reached right down there and picked you right back up. Why did that happen? You say, well, it happened because Peter lost his confidence in Jesus or whatever, began to think it was all about him. It doesn't matter. The whole point was so that Jesus could have put in the Bible, I'm able to make you walk on water, but I'm also able to make you sink. It depends on me. You need to stay close to me. You need to keep your eyes on me. get started with salvation and baptism, but then we need discipleship and we need to be impacting the world with the Word of God just as the Word of God is impacting our lives. We can make a difference by the power of God that is in us. Just like Jesus. That last slide I put up there, I didn't put any of my words on there because I think William Temple said it well. The church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. Yeah. Our mission is not to build bigger churches. It's to reach the lost and the dying in this world. It's not to accumulate things. It's to not be alone when we go to heaven. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, I pray for your Holy Spirit, your word, your power to do its transformation.